I'd like to uh, welcome everyone here tonight and thank you for coming. My name is Marty Shingler. I'm the chair of the Siemens Distinguished Lecture Series in Engineering, Manufacturing, and Entrepreneurship. Uh, the series is funded by a generous donation from the Siemens Building Technologies Division. Representing Siemens here tonight is John Vernack and Dave Urich. Our speaker tonight is Jonathan Naft. He's uh, started uh, Geauga Rehabilitation in 1995 and then also started Myomo in 2012. There's a story behind that I'm sure he'll talk about. He's an engineer who specializes in artificial limb in the brace industry. Uh, he also has some experiences in the Paralympics, uh, individuals who, and he'll talk about individuals who wear the technology. So uh, I think I'll just let him talk about some various other things, let him introduce himself, talk about some of his stories, and uh, let Jonathan take the stage. Thank you everyone for coming. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Professor uh, Schindler here and also Bob Kahn for recruiting me to join you in this talk today. And I'm very grateful to Siemens and such a great company to help shed the, or help us, to help share the awareness of what's going on uh, in the field of medical devices. The things I'm gonna talk about today aren't what's coming in the future. I'm gonna talk about what's here now. Uh, it's exciting stuff and it's a great time to be in the field. So let's get right into it. If I say the word performance enhancement, what do you think of? Right? Anybody? Drugs. Drugs, athletes, right? So there's a new kind of performance enhancement that's coming around that's controversial. So I thought I would share some of that with you. If you look at these pictures, it's really spanning the whole athletic realm. And I thought I would include the deflate gate since we just had uh, the Patriots in town. But you know, with our athletes these days, there seems to be an increasing discussion on a monthly basis with regard to performance enhancement. But there's a smaller picture here that you can't see. So let's zoom in on it. Now if I say performance enhancement, what do you think of? Okay. You're not thinking of what you were thinking about a minute ago, right? Is this athlete performance enhanced? So some say yes, right? Okay, you, you don't have to answer, but think about it. And maybe at the end of this presentation, your opinion may change. So my name's John Naft. I'm an engineer. I uh, am in the in the space of artificial limbs and bracing. I've been doing this for 26 years, and I'm gonna share with you today some things in my story, and I'm really gonna focus on the students. Uh, at one time, uh, not too long ago, I was a student myself, trying to decide what is it that I wanted to do. I'm gonna focus on some of the work that I did where I started a company called Geauga Rehab Engineering, which is right down the street in, in Chardon. Uh, I'm quite proud to say that it's turned into certainly a national name and lately is becoming even more global. About four years ago, I was also recruited to join a startup uh, at MIT where we wanted to do something that was truly groundbreaking and new to a new space to help a separate set of folks who didn't have a lot of options. So I'm looking forward to sharing that with you too. So the agenda today, I want to give you some examples of technology. So as you were waiting for the talk to start, I had a nice set of pictures going on. So everything you saw in the pictures is commonplace. So when you go to the, when you go to the Indians playoff game at the end of the week, you'll be surprised at how many people in the crowd are wearing these devices. Some you'll see and some you won't see. And they do so well. And the improvements of these devices has just gotten just so incredible that it gets to be more and more fun. It's turning more now into what was a niche industry to a billion dollar industry. And the number of jobs that are coming in this space are increasing. The number of students who are showing more interest are, are just growing as well. So I'm gonna share with you what are some of the hot devices. Then I'm gonna just share the path that I took to get to Lakeland today then I really want to spend some time talking about if this interests you, how can you get into the space? So 
You don't necessarily have to be an engineer. You don't have to be a clinician. There's business side of this. There's a marketing side of this. Uh, there's certainly a, a legal side of this. There's the engineering side and there's the clinical side. So I'm going to share some of those things with you. And at the end, I've brought a couple devices. So if anybody wants to come down and, and join me for a, you know, a short post discussion, I'm happy to do that as well. Let's go back to this gentleman in the picture I started with. So let's take a look at this gentleman's legs. The media has deemed the Blade Runner. This is the gentleman that ran in the Olympics. And it's a great story. So you know, the first story is obviously around performance enhancement. Is he performance enhanced? So as one who builds devices for athletes, the answer to a certain extent is yes but he still has to make them move. So these legs don't make him run, he still has to run. But the legs themselves are designed, this is a very high-tech carbon lamination. So the thickness of the lamination, the curves of the lamination are very much precisely designed to make someone go fast, to be light. When you run, think about this for a second. If you're gonna sprint, does your heel ever hit the ground? Right? It doesn't. You're accelerating, you're pushing off. You don't see a heel on here, right? But when we run, our knees, our ankles, our bodies adapt to the shock and they propel. So that's why this is a spring. So no pun intended, but it gives us a spring in our step. And for an athlete who wants to run, we need even a bigger spring. So uh, these are lightweight, these are springy, these are expensive. These are often custom designed, and the athletes are getting faster. So I sat on a panel a long time ago with the topic of this gentleman who ran in the Olympics was initially banned because he has devices that are indeed, to some, performance enhancing. But then after a lot of media, after some legal action, he was allowed to run. And he actually did well. He qualified for the Olympics. He did well in, I think, his first two heats. And then ultimately, I think there's this guy, did anybody hear of this Usain something? <laughs> Pretty fast. So, but what's gonna happen four years from now? So immediately following the Olympics is an event called the Paralympics. So uh, I'm gonna tell you some things about uh, my path too. I was very fortunate to be part of the Paralympics uh, two times. So um, I was in Atlanta when the Olympics and the Paralympics were here and my role was to work with some of the track athletes there. And then I also did it the following Winter Olympics where I worked with a lot of the skiers. So I'm going to show you some pictures of some of that. And we really do engineer these devices to be you know, the best that they can be. But if we think about it on a non-athletic level, what about the individual who has perhaps a leg with some paralysis and let's just performance enhance them enough so that they can manage their activities of daily living. Let's get them to walk across the kitchen and cook. Let's get them to stand up and reach those items out of the top of the cabinet that are otherwise hard to get. So let me talk a little bit about the timeline that I went through. And I'm going to show you some devices. So we're going to click over to some videos for a minute. So the first one I'm going to show you doesn't have sound, but I want to show you the running. Did anyone see this in the, in the actual Olympics? So those of you who have not, you're in for, I think, some inspiration here. Notice the crowd. It's a sold out stadium. Same sold out stadium for the Paralympics. pretty fast. Mm -hmm. 
So this was the heat that he w was his last heat, I believe. But prior to this, he did uh, exceptionally well. So, you know, a lot of good camaraderie with the other runners congratulating him. I think we're seeing athletes who are wearing devices becoming more and more mainstream. So, where's it gonna go? I can assure you in four more years, they're gonna be even faster. So, stay tuned for some interesting debates. Show you a little bit more on the devices themselves and how they're made. So this is a prosthesis for one who has an amputation between their knee and the top of their hip. So this top part is made completely custom for the individual. Think about the crown on your tooth, uh, if you've ever had dental work done. So it has to fit precisely on what's left of your tooth. So this top part of the prosthetic has to fit precisely on the patient's limb so that it's comfortable, it's durable, and it walks naturally. This is the most important, important part. To a certain extent, I believe that we can get people to walk reasonably well on a stick if this part fits really well. But it doesn't hurt to have some beautiful hydraulic technology underneath to smooth out your gait. So this part is custom made. And what's happening now, in, in the earlier days of my career, we took molds of patients' legs using plaster or, or other methods. And then these were handmade. Just a little bit before my time, these were made of wood. And now these are made of composite materials that are carbon and, uh, and Kevlar and a lot of very, very lightweight but strong materials. Now the interesting thing is, is where's the industry going? So throughout most of my career, this required significant expertise to fit. And if you um, weren't experienced, you weren't well educated, you didn't put your time in, if this didn't fit well, your patient would not be successful. But where are we today? Today these are done with computers and, and digital imaging. So uh, we now take what looks, a tool which looks like the Starship Enterprise, and we wave it in front of the patient's body part that's left, and it creates a 3D rendering on our computer of the patient, so no more plaster, no more hand making these. Okay, then they get ported into the lab where the socket gets made. And clearly you guys have heard of the 3D printing space, correct? So to a certain extent, where's this going? So in the hands of a skilled prosthetist, is it gonna end up by way of Google, by way of Amazon, by way of 3D printing? So stay tuned as the industry evolves. Costs will come down. Quality will continue to go up. Um, there is an expertise that is highly refined to get that to happen. So I think there's a long way to go still before the two technology and the expertise really come together. Now these components from here down, <clears throat> these are more produced not individually. So this is a knee which comes uh, from a company out of California, and it has a hydraulic cylinder, and upon fitting, the resistance in the hydraulic cylinder is tuned to match the patient's resistance. Much like, have you ever tried to close a door that has a hydraulic closer on it? And sometimes the more you push, the harder it pushes back. But now imagine if you can control that with a computer, which is reading whether the toe is hitting, whether the heel is hitting, how fast the person is walking, and what's the angle of the knee. So all that gets fed into a small computer which controls the orifice inside the hydraulics, and that's what makes these things come together. So just a quick explanation. Then of course the foot, uh, you know, we've talked about. So, uh, you know, this one's uh, an all carbon braid material that has a specific lamination and spring density to it to help smooth out how an individual walks. Let me, um, let me flip the coin to a different story for a minute. So the first part was about people who are missing a limb. Now I'm gonna show you some things for people who have limbs but otherwise have difficulty using it. <clears throat> for example, to me, if a patient has had a stroke or perhaps a spinal cord injury, 
and they, or brachial plexus injury, and they have an arm, but they otherwise can't use it, isn't that the same as having an amputation to a certain extent? So if you have your arm, but you can't use it, it's almost uh, the same needs as a prosthetic. <clears throat> so let me show you what some of those devices look like. I'm going to play another video for you. When a person becomes paralyzed, a level of their independence is also robbed from them. And that affects us psychologically and our spirits. There's a part of us that dies. I've been trying to visualize myself a contraption that would enable me to get up and walk. I thought, well, is it going to be an avatar, perhaps a robot? And then I received the phone call to try this new technology. I've heard from so many people that the first thing that they encounter after an injury uh, or an amputation uh, is the word no. And I think we are demonstrating here that there is no such word as no. In 2005, we entered a license agreement with the University of California to commercialize the innovative exoskeleton technology that was developed at the Robotics and Human Engineering Laboratory. ELEX is, as an engineer, one of the most satisfying projects to work on because it's an integration of so many interesting talents, mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, programming control, and really when you bring all those aspects together, that's when you get a really innovative product. To take my first step was just astounding because I bent my knee for the first time in 18 years and I placed my heel on the ground and then I transferred my weight and then I took another step and another one and it was so natural and that was what really gripped me. In my field of spinal cord injury, uh, we work with people who typically are paralyzed for the rest of their life. For the first time in history, we can start to think about giving movement back. I think what's particularly exciting about exoskeleton research currently is that it's becoming much more compact and affordable and therefore potentially useful in medical applications. In the future, we will introduce another device that is specially designed for homes. That device will actually allow you to step in it in the morning, go and have your breakfast, then you drive off to work, even wearing it. You can walk in the park, you can go with your friends to the ball game, and it's uh, pretty much your companion during the whole day. I'm not meant to be in my wheelchair, sitting down and rolling. I'm going to be tall in my body, to walk on sidewalks, to go into a restaurant. I'm doing it! <laughs> but most importantly, to hike in nature. This is not a wave of the future. This is reality. So the, you know, the key point here that I want to mention, this isn't coming soon. This is on the market now. These companies are growing. Uh, I believe at this time there are now four that have gone public. It is becoming a billion dollar industry. So you're going to see these become more and more mainstream. And I think we're very fortunate here in Cleveland because we have a company, as you know, Parker Hannafin, is moving very aggressively with a fantastic device called the Indigo. So I think you're going to see more and more press here in Cleveland and you're going to start hopefully seeing some users mainstream here wearing the device pretty soon. Okay, next I want to talk to you about something that's a little bit closer to me on the device line. So this is a device which is called the Myo Pro. A little over four years ago, I got approached um, from a team in, in Cambridge from MIT that was spinning out some technology. 
a student, so someone like, like you in the room, had this concept of if amputees wear a prosthetic arm and we can put the arm on that person and control it with a motor, why can't we do that for someone who still has an arm but just can't use it? Same type of philosophy. Now the way that we drive this technology, we use something called a surface electrode to detect EMG. Think of it this way. When you get in your car and your car engine does work, the, the engine roars, and as a result of the work that the engine does, a byproduct is produced and it's exhaust, and it comes out the tailpipe. Now if you wanted to, you can measure the exhaust, and then you could have things happen as a result of the measurement of the exhaust. So the human body has something that I think is somewhat analogous to that. So when the brain sends a signal to your muscle, the muscle can try to do work. It may not be able to do work really at all, like for example, even bend against gravity, but if the signal can get there, let's just say it forms a little spark, and then that spark is a wave which comes out, think of it as electricity, and we can read that. So this microphone that's sitting on my jacket is picking up a wave out of my voice. If I put a sensor on my skin, it's going to listen for the same wave. Now it's incredibly small, and it comes out like, do you remember watching Charlie Brown's teacher? Do you remember what Charlie Brown's teacher said? Wah, 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 wah. I know you've seen it, it's okay. <laughs> so when the wave comes out, we have to decipher that. But we already know how to do that, right? Who here picks up their cell phone and says, pushes a button and says, call home, right? So yeah, what's happening? The wave's coming out of your mouth, the phone microphone hears that, the computer inside the phone interprets that wave, it knows that it's unique, and then your phone dials home. Now what happens after that, I'm not responsible for. Because if you're late for dinner or you're in trouble, can't help you there. But when it comes to this technology, we can put a microphone on your skin, and we can listen for the arm to say bend. And we can determine what that, what that wave looks like. So that when that happens, then the motor wakes up and says bend, and, and performs the bend operation. And it can do it for the fingers too. So now, just like you saw for the legs, we're putting bracing on arms. And then people who otherwise can't move their arms now can move their arms. So before I show you a video, I want to ask you a question. So I sit down with the team to design this product. And <clears throat> we're brainstorming and we're playing our own version of Family Feud, so to speak. So who can tell me what's the number one thing, if you have a patient who is otherwise perhaps sitting in a wheelchair and they don't have use of their arms. So what's the number one thing if I ask them, what do you want the most? What can I help you with the most from your arm? What would it be? Anybody? To feed, great answer. That's what I said. I, th I said that was number one. Anybody else, what else would you want it for? Yes, to use, uh, to use, um, use the restroom for, for hygiene, right? Anybody got another answer? Give me one more. To dress, yeah. Would you believe that was not the first answer given to me from the patient I asked first? He said, when I sit in my chair, I need to be able to push myself back up because I put too much pressure on my organs when my body loses position. Whew, I did not see that one coming. That means a stronger motor, that means a harness around the upper body, because think about it, if you're just gonna push your arms down on the chair, but if you don't have the musculature in your shoulders, all that's gonna happen is your shoulders are gonna go up, right? So you push down, your shoulders go up, and then, hmm. So it's a complex problem. So uh, we've been at this for, uh, for several years and we're now on the market. So across the country, starting with our very first generation, we have about 600 of these out now and we're really growing. And we make each one of these right down the street in Chardon. My name is Lucinda. I had a stroke 
on June 15, 2009, about six and a half years ago. It left me with right-sided weakness. The Myopro brace has had a great impact on my life. I'm able to do a lot of things that I would never have thought I would be able to do again with two hands. I feel like I'm more independent in the fact that I can cut my own food now. You know, before, if, if I did order something, I had to have whoever I was with, hey, can you cut my steak for me, please? Whereas now, I'm, I can cut it myself. So I think I'm more dependent in that way. I can wash dishes with both hands now, um, where I primarily take my left hand to dry off a dish, and I hold it with the right hand. Um, before, I couldn't hold it with the right hand at all because my right hand doesn't open and close by itself, where the Myra Pro lets me extend my fingers and close my hand at will. I pretty much had given up hope of ever having both hands again and now I have both hands back to use I mean to open and to close your hand is so important I don't think a lot of people realize how important and how much it can bring to your everyday life when, when, you, when you first put it on your hand stretches out for that very first time it's the best feeling in the world Okay, so I'm helping grow a second company that's based in, in, um, in Cambridge. It's called Myomo. Myomo stands for My Own Motion. The very first patient that put the device on and she moved her arm for the first time said, this is like My Own Motion. So it kind of got shortened to Myomo. So as you see the word Myomo being branded across the country and, and soon to be uh, across, the, across the pond as well, uh, I, I think it's really going to start a lot of growth. You're going to start seeing more people wear these mainstream. While I'm looking at this, think about fashion for a second. So all of us, when we get up in the morning, have a certain identity with how we dress. Right? So what if you have to wear one of these? What does that do to your identity? Does it, does, does it change it? It's a complex problem. So when I initially first started making arms and legs earlier in my career, boy, did we work hard to make them look like an arm, look like a leg. We put synthetic skin on. We even hand painted them and had patients on their legs, for example, we would have them shave uh, hair off their arm, uh, you know, more so on the men, obviously, and they'd put it on and we'd, we'd glue them onto their legs so that we'd have a very realistic leg. That's not so much the case anymore. It's not so much the kid. Look at some. Look at what these legs look like. If you notice the picture that was playing earlier, a uh, very, uh, very uh, nicely dressed woman with a with a red dress and a completely solid black carbon fiber prosthetic arm. So you know it's fashion, um, but it's going to take time to change that. So you know, think of this example, which is a little offbeat, but think years and years ago. If two twin sisters walk into a, you know, a trendy club here in, in Cleveland, and one sister has a sleeve of tattoo, and the other sister is maybe coming in with a walker or, or wearing a prosthetic or custom brace. So the crowd back then, a long time ago, wasn't so accepting of the sleeve of, of tattoo. And then when they looked at the other sister, perhaps they're thinking, oh wow, you know, she has a disability. So fast forward to today, the same two sisters walk into a, uh, you know, a, a club and the, the people in the club will look at the sister with the sleeve of tattoo and they'll say, wow, that's art, you know, that's character, that's pretty cool because the society has changed. You know, I'm not really sure how it got there, but we've changed as a society. We're very accepting of that now. But what about the person who walks into the club and they still have a device that they're wearing? Is your perception changed? Hmm. You know, is that device considered fashion or is that device still, you know, a little unknown? And I think you're really going to see that change. That's why I showed the pictures that we had there. Legs, if you saw on the, um, you know, on the slideshow prior to the talk starting, 
My favorite one that I made was, was chrome. It was all chrome. My vision was the Terminator movie. You remember the Metal Man? I just thought that was the slickest thing, and I just happened to have a, you know, have a patient who you know, really wanted to go for that kind of look. Look, you know, look at this one. You know, this is you know, an electrically controlled device that has lightning bolts you know, built into it. This doesn't look like a leg, you know, but this is fashion. So you know, the industry is really changing. So when you saw uh, this gal's device, so she works at a, um, at a beauty supply store and she wears her device there. It's Ferrari red. And as customers go through her checkout line, she's wearing the device. And she's very, very, um, she's very wonderful. She's happy to answer questions. If someone says, hey, what is that? Tell me about that. She's happy to, happy to do that. You know, and, and why? Maybe it's because um, that's her marathon t-shirt. So while I cue the presentation back up, if you've ever done something like a marathon, you're pretty proud you're going to get the t-shirt. Someday, if I ever do one, I'm getting at least two. <laughs> I'll have the logo on the front and back. I've done a marathon. And I think if you're one that is wearing one of these devices, that's a marathon. And they're pretty proud, and they, you know, they should be. And you should show that off. How did I get started in this? I was a student, like, like most of you. I was trying to figure out, what the heck did I want to do? You know, what do you want to be when you grow up? <laughs> First of all, I'm not sure that I have, uh, but I'm working on it. Um, so I decided I'm going to go to college. So what did I like? Remember the erector sets? So when I was a kid, boy, did I have the erector sets. I like to build things. I was good at building things. I like to build things, and I like to build something just creatively that came you know, right from nowhere. So everybody here has something, right? We're all unique, we all have a strength somewhere. So that was one of mine. So I took that off to the Ohio State University and I studied electrical engineering because the Lego sets got even cooler when I could make them run with batteries. <laughs> so I added the electrical component to it. Then after Ohio State, and while at Ohio State, I got exposed to what I'm trying to expose to you. You know, the wonderful field of medical devices. So I took the next step and I decided to go to graduate school where I went to Northwestern University and I honed my education and skills on the industry of artificial limbs and braces. And I learned the very bare bones basics of what it takes to build these, what are the people like who have to wear them, where's the industry gonna go, what's the challenges, what's the cost, the whole works. And I really enjoyed that. Then I came back to Cleveland after graduation, and I worked for a terrific company here in Cleveland that allowed me to get my start. But after about five years, I had um, an entrepreneurial spirit where I wanted to do some different things. I didn't want to just continue to fit and, and, and work with patients with existing technology, but I wanted to do more square pegs and round holes, things that weren't done before. So I went off on my own and I started a company called Geauga Rehab Engineering, um, 1995. Uh, just one employee, uh, uh, you know, with a passion and, and, and some ideas. As I started to grow, I got some actual office space, started to, uh, you know, grow my reputation as, as um, you know, one who has passion, one who's dependable. Uh, one who's willing to work hard and go the extra mile so that um, the devices that I'm trying to design will make a difference. And one of the things along the way which I really enjoyed was this, you know, was this Paralympic movement. So when I very first got started, it was a pretty small endeavor. But look at where it is now. I mean, you all saw the Rio commercials and the Rio TV. Uh, it was, all the, ga all the games were televised. The opening ceremonies is just as hard as a ticket to get to the opening ceremonies at the Olympics, and it always follows the Olympics right after at the same venue. So in these athletes, to get on the, uh, you know, the U.S. squad for the Paralympic team, I would argue is every bit as hard to get on the, you know, the Olympic team for those that are able-bodied athletes. But it's starting to cross over. So you have patients now 
who are doing both sports. So, you know, what's going to happen when the next swimmer wearing a prosthesis can swim faster than the Olympic swimmer um, that's otherwise able-bodied? Or what happens when the runner can beat Usain? So, but that's where we're going. So it's going to be really fun. So if it interests you, there's lots of ways to be a part of it. I'm going to show you how in a minute. Oh, uh, it's just a quick couple of photos from the Paralympics. Uh, it's a wide range of, of events. Uh, I was uh, fortunate enough to work uh, the ski hill at Snow Basin in, in Utah with uh, the Paralympics there. And whew, they're fearless, just like the Olympic skiers. And I'm not a horrible skier, but I don't have a chance of keeping up with any of them. Some ski with a prosthesis, some ski without. It depends the division that they're entered. But you can see some of the other adaptations. This is an archer. So special designed equipment, special rules. You know, there's an individual there uh, who's a bilateral. And this is where we worked. So as the athletes would come in, um, you know, we would help repair their devices. You know, the other thing that's interesting with the Paralympics is the difference between the countries, the athletes, and what they wear. So I have this fantastic picture in my office where there's all the runners on the starting line. And, you know, there's this runner who's got a, uh, you know, an $80,000 high-tech carbon prosthetic. And then there's a runner here from perhaps, a, you know, a third world country who's literally leather and metal. Uh, that's an interesting story that's growing too. So. Stay tuned. Okay, so um, about four and a half years ago, I started to mention I got recruited by Myomo, and we started working on this arm project. Uh, that to me is what I think many of you, you know, here that are students are in the room that I had then. So it starts with an idea. You know, so can we do this? So can we, you know, can we, can we build an arm for someone who already has an arm? And then can we make them feed themselves? Can we make them push themselves up in the chair, which we weren't expecting, as I told you. But, you know, but what else can we have them do? So that's an interesting journey. So the first thing we need to do is formulate the, you know, the theory. How can, we, how can we do this? And then once we get the theory of how we think we can do it, then we need to raise capital to do it. So, it's really um, you know, a challenge sometimes to raise capital. So if you want to raise money to do your idea, and many of you that are students, you have an idea. I don't know what it is, but you know, there's, um, th there's avenues to start and, and do your project. So we had ours. Has anybody ever seen the Shark Tank? So I got to live through my own version of the Shark Tank. So I put on one of my nicer suits, and I went around the country to the different uh, venture capitalists, private equity firms, uh, angel investors, and what I really had to learn was my two-minute elevator speech. So a much shorter version of this. And the elevator speech is something more like, have you ever seen an individual who has trouble moving their arm from paralysis? Have you ever seen that remediated? We have a solution and it works, we have proof. Now we need to scale that. It's never been done before. We're a first mover in a new space. How would you like to be a part of something big? Now, I said that you know, quickly, and boy, did I do it wrong a lot, a real lot. So uh, you know, the first one I was advised afterwards, uh, Mr. Naft, uh, you really need to get to the point faster. OK. OK, then you know, the second one that I, I made the pitch to I was so excited, spent a fair amount of money on airline tickets, only to find out that the people around the table, although they invest in medical device startup companies, they're more biotech. They're not really externally powered devices. So it was, John, that's a really cool idea, and it sounds like it has potential, but it's not really our space. Hmm. Could have done my homework a little bit better. <laughs> so I kept getting better, and I started finding the groups of investors who look for this sort of technology. And sure enough, we were able to raise capital. So once we raise capital, then we can start building. And it's a team. It's an absolute team. You know, I think back to the days of the early, let's call them inventors. 
we have a team that consists of business people, marketing people, legal people, engineers, technicians. It's really a big, big circle that everyone has to work together and then the project comes together. I think when we first really got rolling on this, on this arm, there was 18 of us on one device because of all the expertise that we really needed to pull together. Okay, so here I am, I'm at Lakeland. What's the message here? So the message here is, first of all, if you have an idea, have the courage to run with it. The best thing you can do is surround yourself with people who know more than you. And that's a, that's a strength. So I could tell you, I, I'm very confident with what, I, with what, let's say, I know. But when it comes to knowing, I know the most what I don't know. And you can't say that too many times fast. Do you understand? So my strength is in the space of prosthetics and orthotics. My strength is not in fundraising. My strength is not in marketing. So what do I do? I find someone who has that strength. And I give them a big glass of Kool-Aid. And at the end of the glass of Kool-Aid, they're ready to join the team. <laughs> because that's important. You have to have passion. And then the people that are on your team have to share your passion. So we formed a team. And so what I'm telling you is, you've got a couple of ways to go down your road. So if this is for you, the space of medical device, that are devices, that are arms, their legs, their powered braces, you don't have to necessarily be you know, the engineer who's designing the algorithms that are decoding the EMG. But you can be the business person that understands you know, where the money goes. So what are the opportunities? So, you know, on the road ahead, let's start with business. This is a billion dollar industry. And it's growing. And it's going to keep growing. You know, the things that we saw in the very first movie, Alien, you remember when Sigourney Weaver strapped in that suit, right? You guys remember that? That's what we're doing today. And that's what's for sale on the market. It's not cheap. It's expensive. So we have to figure out ways to get these things less costly. We have to figure out ways to scale them so that it's easy for people to get around the globe. Okay, no, you know, no matter who you are, no matter where you live. We live in a world where devices are covered, fortunately, by the insurance carriers. So think about this scenario. Um, you know, business, to a certain extent, is risk management. So think about the patient that I showed earlier in the wheelchair. So I'm not exactly sure what that wheelchair price cost. Okay, just for the sake of using round numbers, I'm going to say it's a $20,000 wheelchair. So the patient gets in that wheelchair, leaves their home, can wheel themselves to the, you know, mobilize to the subway, can get on the subway, can mobilize to the health clinic, get to their, you know, their place of employment. It's a heck of a challenge. And it's very daunting, but it can be done. And to a certain extent, it can be done safely. Okay, and that's maybe a $20,000 cost. So now, what are the risks on the business side if we put somebody in an exoskeleton that stands them up? Okay, can they travel the same distance? Can they do it safely? Is there now a fall risk? And then the device costs more than maybe the wheelchair. So. There's this, there's this very difficult question to answer that's between an entitlement and a need. So we have to do a better job of defining that. So um, I have the same conversations you know, myself as I manage my own personal business. You know, is this something I want or is this something that I need? So with science, we can demonstrate that it's not something that you want, it's something that you need. So here's an example. So a patient who's in a wheelchair, there's a high susceptibility to ulcerations on your bottom from sitting in a wheelchair for a very long time. There's a high susceptibility to one who develops uh, cardiovascular issues because the, you know, the trunk is not necessarily upright and reaching full capacity for breathing. So maybe that exoskeleton costs more on day one, but fast forward X number of you know, days, weeks, months, years later, I'm willing to bet that it's cheaper, right? Because now your overall patient is healthier. 
In, in the case of this arm, I had a patient come in who was looking to be fit with this device. She had a stroke, she had paralysis on her left arm, paralysis on her left leg. So imagine this scenario. Patient has a cane in their right hand. Patient mobilizes up to the table. Now what do they have to do with the cane? To get something off the table, sorry. I didn't give you enough clues. What do you have to do with the cane if you wanna pick up your dish? You gotta let go of the cane. What happens when you let go of the cane? You're a fall risk, right? So this woman that came to see me, she qualified perfectly for a MyoPro. We began making the MyoPro, it takes two weeks. In the interim, she went home and she let go of her cane. She grabbed the dish with this hand, went to turn to go put it over here, lost her balance and fell. Broke her humerus, broke her collarbone, hit her head. That secondary readmission to the hospital cost more than the primary admission from the stroke. So, you know, I can't prove it obviously, but the more these are mainstream, those risks lessen. And then the cost to the overall economics of the healthcare system will decrease, okay? So there's lots to think about on the, on the business side. You know, what about the marketing? What about the messaging? Is, I'm sure there may be a student here who's thinking about marketing. How do you message this? So, you know, what, what's the messaging? Is it, uh, you know, is it therapeutic? Not really. This is for function. This is so that you take it home on day one and you start learning to cook and clean. Um, I have a gentleman and his wife that came back to see me and she says, John, I love you. My husband has never vacuumed this much in his life. <laughs> it was fantastic. <laughs> so think about the business side of it. It's really big. So for those of you that are here at Lakeland and you're putting some business courses together, perhaps your passion in business will be more in the medical device industry. Let's think about the technical side of it. So there's two pieces to the technical side. There are engineers who design the motor, the electronics, the EMG sensing, but then there are also technicians who assemble and build the devices. So that's a very complex and highly trained job as well. It doesn't necessarily require, you know, the, you know, the extreme, you know, higher level of, of, uh, of engineering, but it requires the skill set of an individual who is good with their hands, who is detail oriented, who is creative, who um, doesn't necessarily have the passion to go all the way down the engineering route, but boy, oh boy, I got some, um, some, some technical staff that work with me. I, they can build anything. They can build anything. I, if I put them to the task and the challenge, hey, can you build a rocket? I bet they could do it. So if you're good with your hand skills, you're creative, you're detail oriented, and you're taking some of the technology type classes here at Lakeland, there are avenues in medical device space. It could be wheelchairs, it could be you know, technicians in hospitals who are reassembling and fixing equipment. It could be something in my space where you're assembling prosthetics. Okay, uh, last but not least is the clinical application. So this one requires an advanced degree. So if you're here at Lakeland and this interests you, use it as a springboard to go to the next level. Work hard while you're here at Lakeland. The, you know, focus your, focus your academics on the science and the technology and the mathematics. Think about things like 3D printing um, and, and anything in that space to get a means to then go to the next level of education. And education doesn't stop. So don't put a clock on it. Don't, don't think, well, you know, geez, you know, this is, uh, you know, 2017 and I gotta, you know, be done by then. I've been doing this for 26 years. I'm still taking classes. I still go to seminars to learn. I, if I see something that's new, I'm still gonna always further my education because the grass is not gonna grow under my feet. Right? Things change. So, like I said, when I started, our first legs were made out of wood. I couldn't make a wooden leg. No way. But I could certainly make one out of carbon. But I'm certainly getting into 3D printing. I'm not going to let that pass me by. So what am I doing? Going back and taking classes. 
so I can become more of an expert on where things are going to go next. So education doesn't stop. So don't let that daunt you. Look at, uh, or don't let it be daunting. Take things in chunks. So, you know, your education as a whole is an impossible challenge. But if you start here, you can use that as a springboard to then get to the next level, and that's manageable. So um, the clinicians who fit these devices, so if a patient comes in the room and this has to get fit and fine-tuned, that's a master's level uh, clinician who has to pass the state boards in Ohio. So uh, there are um, you know, schools around the country. Uh, there are, unfortunately, there are none right here in Ohio uh, that offer that master's levels program, but the closest are in Pennsylvania uh, and Illinois. So uh, that avenue does exist. There's a website called um, opcareers.org. It stands for orthoticprostheticcareers.org. Very, very clear pathways of how to get into the space. Um, you can use, you know, the colleges are competitive, but as a, as a father of three sons who have watched them go through the whole college application process, the one thing I learned is if you're applying here, what do you have to show me that you've built the tools to get in here? And there's no reason why that doesn't start here as your first step. Okay? So um, that's the last aspect of you know, the space in the field. So um, <laughs> somebody, um, I, I was giving a talk to some other students and I said, you know, the best career is when you manage to marry your individual talent with one of the world's needs. So if you can find those two, it'll be good. Okay, so that's what I have for you today. I would love to take some questions. It's a fantastic question. So I do the same thing. So when I work with runners, I'm gonna make them faster. No different than if I'm an athletic trainer uh, and working with an athlete, I'm gonna give them a program to make them faster. So I do indeed precisely that. And you hit it right on the head. So think about if your legs can, can maintain a certain speed, but what if I lengthen them just a little bit? that you could cover a little bit more ground, right? So he happens to be bilateral, missing both legs. But there is a balance because you start raising people up and then you start to lose a little bit of your balance and dysfunction and your body's natural alignment gets thrown out of whack. So as you're starting to run, this leg will twist this way, this leg will twist this way and you start to become very inefficient. Uh, and you also become a risk for injury. So to directly answer your question, Yes, indeed, our goal as designers of this technology is to make people as fast as they can. Now, whether or not that's right or wrong and whether or not that's performance enhanced, I think you have to answer that question yourself. But I would put it in a certain context. Did you watch the swimming? Okay, so a couple of Olympics ago, did you see the suits they were wearing? They were from here down to the bottom of their legs down to here. And those suits were engineered for speed. So some athletes used them, some athletes didn't use them, and they ruled, okay, we're going by way of NASCAR and everybody's gonna have the same, I think, type of suit. I'm not an expert on that, but um, I think what we're going to see happen is certain rules will be put into place so that we can understand what is the limitation of the actual athlete and how much is the equipment enhancing that. So that's yet to be determined, but it's gonna become much more mainstream because these athletes are getting faster, faster and faster. So um, you know, ideally, as more and more come into the pipeline, I don't wanna see one runner in the Olympics. I wanna see that that's an amputee. I wanna see more than that. Um, but, you know, think outside the box too. So if you have your arm and you're wearing this, so there are companies right now that are working on an arm brace. What if I'm, I'm able-bodied and I put the arm brace on, but now I have a heck of a motor and torque and I can now hold a jackhammer over my head and hammer something on the top of a highway garage, okay? Imagine putting that guy on a weight bench at the Olympics. 
right? So I'm not sure you know, where this is all going to go. Um, my opinion is I'm going to continue to um, do everything I can to make the equipment allow an individual to achieve the most performance that they can get. And I I'm going to let the rule makers um, dis use their expertise. Mine is on the technology. Question? So if you didn't hear the question, the question was essentially, I'm going to phrase it just a little bit differently, is we're making this technology, but the technology is now being capable of doing things that not only can enhance, so if you have a hand, the hand can feel, the hand can sense, correct? Okay, so you know, where are we going? So that technology, coincidentally, there's a fantastic team right here at the Cleveland VA, which is really leading the way on the sense of touch. So I was watching a, you know, a video of a patient that's an, an arm amputee wearing an arm prosthesis where they're, where they're blinded, they can't see the object, but when they touch it with their prosthetic hand, they're able to start detecting whether it's smooth, whether it's rough, whether it's hot, whether it's cold. So um, I just finished our 2017 planning meeting. So everything you're describing is here today. So what, what I wanna do is um, I want to come up with smarter devices that play more in the space of the Internet of Things. So, in other words, the Internet of Things. So, um, you know, I could pull out my cell phone right now and I can turn the lights on at my house. That's the Internet of Things, right? So now, what if your prosthetic arm or what if your myopro arm, which is on a stroke patient, is smart enough to detect what else is going on in the human body and maybe that device can, can call the security company, just like your home security system, and then it can call you back and say, uh, Mr. Jones, this is your monitoring company. Your blood pressure is going up. Your skin temperature is going high. We suggest you get to your doctor. So that's where it's going um, as well. Um, you know, will some of this technology um, enhance the usability so that it's in the workplace that's otherwise better than another able-bodied person. Because if you're using your hand and you're working on a certain set of equipment that can tell you things that you otherwise have to learn from another piece of equipment, so now your hand automatically tells it and knows it and does it. So in other words, let's say you're working in a factory environment and your hand uh, is on the mechanism that you're assembling or building. But the hand is smart enough that it knows what to do. So in other words, here's a more practical example. Uh, a patient who is an arm amputee walks into their house and then as they walk closer to their refrigerator, uh, the RF frequency in the chip by the refrigerator automatically puts the hand in refrigerator open mode. So as you approach the refrigerator, your arm comes up, your hand opens. So it's ready to open the refrigerator. That's here today. So it's really, really getting exciting. Um, I am also interested in taking these devices smarter. I, I think they should be GPS enabled. They should be Wi-Fi enabled. They should be able to, to a certain extent, um, share data. And maybe that data is shared with, you know, to a certain extent, depending on the ethics, with your employer and with your health insurance company. So many companies and hospital programs are already wearing a Fitbit, right? So if you walk X number of steps in a day, your health insurance will be less expensive for you, right? If you go to the physician for a checkup at least X number of times a year, you keep your weight below a certain level, your cholesterol numbers are below a certain level, perhaps you have a lesser price on your health insurance. So now how does that fit into these devices, right? That's here today. That's the stuff that we're working on. And it's complicated. So when I sit down and I want to do, and I, I get very passionate and say, yes, let's GPS enable this. So that if I go to Medical Mutual of Ohio, and Medical Mutual is the payer, they're the insurance company, they're paying for these, okay, and they're expensive. And Medical Mutual wants to say, John, we want to know how well these patients are doing. Okay, open up your computer. They're GPS. This one's at Walmart shopping. This one's in their kitchen and they're eating. And this one's, and then there's, there's value there. Now, of course, we're still a long way away from that because the whole, I mean, we're already battling it with Google and cybersecurity and, and, and that whole space. But these devices are getting smarter. 
Now, how smart can they be? And what will our society allow them to do is another story. So it's a great question. Yes. Yeah, so that's a whole other space. So uh, we use experts, we use patent lawyers who, so the first answer is yes, we've patented. Um, we do share certain things because our group happens to be collaborative and to a certain extent, in order to get the space to continue to grow, we need to share. So that's a big, that's a big part of it. That's a big reason why I'm here today. But there is very much a business side of this. So we're spending, uh, you know, millions of dollars developing this technology. And to a certain extent, we need to protect our investment, so we do have to patent this technology. But then, um, you know, that space in itself is getting more and more complicated. I mean, we hear on the news and the radio all the time, this cell phone company is suing this cell phone company because they, they took this from the other. And that's, that's business. That's unfortunately how it is. Um, you know, I hope that as time goes by, um, you know, there becomes a better mechanism for controlling that. Right now, the mechanism is we seek out patent attorneys. Uh, we meet with them on a regular basis. It's extremely costly uh, and it's extremely complicated. We literally spell out, uh, you know, on this device, we have an extremely robust patent file of which, um, you know, some excuse me, some is still shared with, uh, with MIT. So um, it's very, very important to us. And you wouldn't find me here sharing and talking about it unless we had done that first. So if you're in the paralegal space or if you're in the, you know, thinking about a, a legal career, oh, this is a growing space. So I don't wanna talk to, well, I shouldn't say I don't want, I am more apt to work with a legal team who has experience in the medical device space because that's what I need. Great question. Yes. Sure, so it's a fantastic question uh, and it's a problem. So if you didn't hear the question in the back is what about adjustments? So what if you have a child, um, so um, to exactly to your point, the leg that you saw the runner in, he cannot walk in every day. Um, if you've ever had a sprinter shoe on, so if he tried to walk in that leg with his body vertical instead of leaning forward in the running position, he would have to, if you saw him walking, he would have to walk that way because the legs are designed at an angle which is this way. So you can't really, you can't really walk in those. So that's a very expensive carbon laminated foot. And you know, he's very fortunate to have sponsorships and financial backing. So when he's done, he changes out that prosthesis and a prosthesis could cost $50,000. So he can take that $50,000 leg off and put it over here and put this one on to go out to dinner. But in the real world with everyday users, um, most are getting one device. So you're getting one device. So, uh, this device of mine right here, you can't take that in the shower, you can't take that in the swimming pool. So some of these legs you can, some you can't. So it's a fantastic healthcare system that we have here, but there are limitations and it's very frustrating. So um, that boils down to the question that I said in the lecture a few minutes ago, what do you need and what do you want? So you need a leg that can get you through your daily activities. You want a leg that you can sprint with. You want a leg that you can swim with. So at what point is the appropriate marriage for that? And that's where the decisions are at right now between the industry, the insurance companies, and there's a lot of round table on that. So unfortunately, there's still a lot of, um, you know, if you have the means, you have a better device. So if you happen to have an unlimited amount of finance, you can have an unlimited number of legs. And you can have one that can go in the pool, you can have one that can sprint, and you can have one that has a lightning bolt design on it. And that's fantastic. But unfortunately, to the masses, that's not available. 
So they're try the average user is, is fit with a medical device that is most appropriate for the bulk of their needs. But it's a problem and it's gonna get, um, you know, it's driving us, you know, as technology. So uh, I'm working heavily on a pediatric version. So the first two questions that I have to solve is what happens when they grow and it doesn't fit? And then what happens when they have a temper tantrum and they take a, you know, a $40,000 device and start doing this to it? It's gotta hold up. So those are some square pegs and round holes, which I really enjoy doing, but stay tuned. How are we doing on time? At 8.25. Okay, so we should wrap. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy. the questions I love. You know, I, I love the excitement, I love the passion for it. Any other questions? Okay, so um, I'll hang around for a few minutes, so if anybody has any other things they wanna discuss, um, you know, once again, I'm uh, extremely appreciative to Siemens for hosting this series to let us spread the awareness of what this technology is, is doing. Um, you know, and I, I thank everyone from Lakeland for their uh, willingness to bring me in. So thank you very much.